So, let me start off by saying, I don't know where else to post this. I've already asked all the forums I can find that are dedicated to this kind of thing. And, as of yet, no one has been able to explain what happened to me and my dog, Kuka. I did get this one weird reply back from an angel fire site made in the late 90s. I found it by chance. Someone had linked it on the 44th page of a wilderness forum I found through a paranormal subreddit. It was in a thread where outdoorsy people shared stories about their strange encounters in the wild. The angel fire site was simple, really just one seemingly endless scrolling page, and as I snooped around, I saw what looked like a 2018 copyright sign written in MS Paint on the header of the site. The header was a black bar with what looked like an all-seeing eye badly drawn, again with paint over it. The eye was closed. I sat there reading the page for a good 30 minutes before realising there was just way, way too much to get through in one sitting. So I started to scroll and skim and grew more sceptical as I did. The site seemed to be written by someone with way too much time in their hands. It spoke of conspiracies and secret agencies and hidden bases across America, and as well as other phenomena. There was a rambling section about UFOs and USOs, which is where I found a few first-hand accounts the author had gathered about the Phoenix Lights. I read it, then quickly scrolled all the way down to the bottom of the page noticing the last entry labelled September 2001. I scrolled back up and saw that on the side of the site, just right under the header, was an option to contact the author. I hadn't seen it before. I figured it was worth a shot. So I typed up my experience into the little text box, entering my email address, and hit submit. Almost immediately, I got a response back. It was in a long string of zeros and ones, which I translated from binary to this. We see you. After the initial wave of shock, I realised that it was probably just someone messing with me. I mean, my story is... crazy. So they probably just thought I was trolling them and trolled me back. But then, the weirdest thing happened. As I clicked out of my email and back to the site, I realised the all-seeing eye wasn't closed anymore. It was open. I closed the site and sat in silence for a few minutes, fuming about the message I received, before deciding that I wanted to give whoever was trolling me a piece of my mind. I tried reopening my closed tab, but was taken to an error page. Confused, I retraced my steps back to the subreddit, then to the wilderness forum, where I clicked on the link again. This time, I was taken to an angel fire error page, saying that the site didn't exist. I remember saying out loud to myself, What the hell? But it didn't matter. The site was gone. Still, it gave me the necessary information I needed to keep reading up on those lights over Phoenix. But, no answers. I need answers. I want answers. Which is why I'm here. I don't know where else to turn. Please help me. I'll try to explain it the best I can. And I'll begin by asking my question again. Do any of you remember the Phoenix Lights? Happened way back in the 90s. March 13th, 1997 to be exact. Pretty much the entirety of Phoenix, Arizona and then some saw these lights flying slowly, silently, over a ridiculously large vicinity. The object in question was described to be huge, at least a mile long with a string of these orangey-greenish orbs of light that never wavered in brightness. Some people saw five lights 
with two lights following. Others saw the other two lights docking and undocking from a larger craft which was shaped like a triangle or a boomerang or a chevron. Over the course of a few hours, this object flew over the entire state of Arizona, leaving hundreds and hundreds of witnesses in its wake. Still, to this very day, the witnesses who saw the lights are looking for answers. They refuse to believe the government's official explanation that they were just flares from the local military base and claim that what they saw could not have been from this world, that it was otherworldly, unexplainable, impossible. They refuse to be mocked or silenced or defeated. Of course, I am absolutely not an expert, and this is just a very simplistic description. But honestly, after seeing the stories on the Angel Fire site and looking into it a bit more, I realised that maybe, just maybe, I believe them. That the lights they saw were unexplainable, inexplicable. And I believe them because, well, I think I just saw the same thing. Except, it wasn't flying in the sky. No, it was gliding under the ocean. Here's what happened. I wanted to try my hand at some winter saltwater night fishing. So, I had taken my dog and set off towards Gardener's Bay, heading from the Peconic River, rounding Long Beach Point. I would heard good things about how rewarding winter and night fishing could be, so I decided to combine them. I would brought Kuka to keep me company. She's a Tamascan, so smart and willful and loyal. I've taken her out fishing before, so she was used to this, and well behaved in the winter. I had given her some little doggy boots with traction and strapped a durable, reflective vest over her, so I knew where she was at all times. Her collar added an extra layer of awareness since it jingled every time she moved. I wasn't really worried of Kuka falling or jumping overboard, but I still took every precaution. I just didn't want to lose her. I'll spare you the boring details and get straight to it. It was a little after 10 and I was getting ready to call it a night. I was looking over my shoulder for the familiar sweep of light from the Long Beach Bar lighthouse and pulling up anchor when I heard it. A gentle bubbling noise, like water beginning to boil. Kuka must have heard it too, because she uncurled herself from the blanket I had laid out for her and cocked her head to the left. I flicked my headlamp from red to bright and looked around. There was a thin stream of bubbles about 30 or so yards away from the stern. One big fish, I thought to myself, watching the stream grow bigger and more frenzied. And then it happened. As I watched, dim, circular lights began to blink on one by one under the ocean's surface. I couldn't really tell how deep they were, but they were huge. They came on perfectly, one after the other, with no delay, and were in the shape of an enormous V. I encountered seven orbs in total. I turned my headlamp off to see them better. They were orange and green and yellow and gaseous and glowed bright underneath the waves. I could just barely make out the black, triangular shape that connected them. And, I cannot stress enough how massive this thing, this triangle was. Not a mile long, but still huge, at least several football fields. As I watched, I realised that it was moving, slowly and silently underneath my boat, towards the open waters of the bay. I was leaning over the side, 
watching it move, not realizing that behind me, something was rising out of the water. I heard Kuka barking, but thought she was just spooked by the V underneath us. I didn't turn until she started to whimper. I regret that. At first, I didn't see anything. It was so dark, and my eyes hadn't fully adjusted from looking at those lights. I blinked, following Cougar's gaze. She was standing by the bow, her paws propped up on the side of the boat, looking up. I looked up too, and there it was. This long, undulating, cylindrical thing, rising out of the water. I couldn't tell if it was mechanical or organic until it started, and there's no other word for it. Moaning. Like a human would if they were in pain, or maybe even pleasure. Kuka was going ballistic. I flicked my headlamp back on to see it better. It looked like it was made from some ever-moving shiny substance like tar or black paint, and I watched, horrified, as faces, human faces, began taking shape in the blackness. It was like there were hundreds of people inside it, fighting to get out. An arm, coated in black goo and dripping, reached out from the cylinder thing and snatched a cougar's vest, then began to pull, hard, Kuka screamed, and I yelled before running forward and lunged at her. I got a good grip on her collar and pulled back. But it was strong, and Kuka's collar was sliding from her neck. Suddenly, there was a loud, foghorn-sounding blast. It sounded like it was coming from underneath the ocean, and the thing let off an angry, fearful sort of yelp, then gave a sharp tug. My elbow connected hard with the side of the boat, and there was a loud crack, followed by an immediate pain. I screamed and let go, watching that thing pull Kuka into the blackness below, disappearing completely. Sobbing, I stood, staring into the ocean, trying to ignore my broken arm. The thing had vanished without so much as a splash. Kuka's collar floated nearby for a moment before sinking into the waters. She was gone. There was another blast of sound, followed by a blinding light that lit up the area around me, and I felt myself falling. The last thing I remember seeing was the ocean rising. Right before I hit the deck, I remember realizing that the ocean wasn't rising at all. The thing underneath was. I woke up, sopping and freezing and disoriented, with someone yelling into my face. It was the Coast Guard. I had run aground along the beach of the Orient Beach State Park, Nearly an hour had passed since I blacked out. I'm surprised I didn't die. I told them what happened, and they took me to the hospital and told me the cops would be with me shortly. I told the cops what happened, and they slapped me with a hefty fine, accusing me of killing Kuka myself, took away my boating license, then had me meet with a psychiatrist. I told the psychiatrist what happened, and she looked at me with sad, misunderstanding eyes and gave me some pills and told me to get some sleep and relax. But I can't. I want to know what happened to Kuka. I want her back. I didn't kill my dog. I love her. I'm not crazy. I saw something crazy but no one believes me. After some searching online, I realized what I saw fit the description of the object that caused the phoenix lights almost exactly. 
But what the hell was that thing? That goopy, moaning, screaming mess that took my dog. Is she dead? Will I ever see her again? I just want to know. Please. Please help me. You know that video on YouTube of the dog with narcolepsy? The one that's all cute and fluffy and bouncing around one second and then the next, plop, onto its face on the ground. And it's cute and you probably sent it to one of your friends or your aunt and thought it was funny. You know that one. Well, this isn't like that at all. I was 16 when I first fell asleep in the middle of class and it wasn't fluffy or cute or funny. My forehead hit the desk with a loud thwack and startled the poor girl next to me and caused the teacher to spin around abruptly. So I was told. Mr. Coolidge, Mr. Coolidge, she had said, as that poor, startled girl shook me awake. Up late last night, playing those video games, watching TV. I didn't know how to answer her, because I hadn't stayed up late, and I wasn't even tired at all that morning. Well, she must have taken my confused silence as an admission of guilt, and she looked at me sternly, and gave me a warning, and told me it would be best to not let that happen again. I couldn't have agreed with her more. It was only a week later, before another thwack, under the same desk, in front of the same teacher, startling the same poor, timid girl in the seat next to me, except this time, instead of verbal chiding and the giggling of a classmate, I was awarded a detention slip and later a grounding from my parents. I'm not staying up late, I pleaded with them, watching as they hauled my TV and my computer down the stairs from the room. I was in bed by 8.30 last night, they either didn't hear or chose to ignore me as they made their way to the basement. And that, I thought, was that. And then, if I recall correctly, it was at the dinner table only a few days later when, yeah, you know, thwack, into my meatloaf and mashed potatoes. And then, finally, my parents figured that it might have been something more than your average teenage drowsiness. Narcolepsy is not like you think. It's not all thwack under desks and hardwood floors and dinner tables. It's more of just a general sleepiness, usually at inappropriate or inopportune times, almost exclusively actually. And I can drive and jog, and I even skydived once, but I just get tired a lot. There's even a medication for it too, although it had some wicked, stomach-churning side effects that I like to avoid. Just like most of you, I live my life normally. Well, I used to at least. My girlfriend is the love of my life, and I don't tell her enough. She's tall, brunette, with slender legs and big eyes, and a smile that reminds you of those cute, fluffy, narcoleptic internet dogs. She loves the Beatles and the movie Airplane, and she does this annoying thing where, whenever I yawn, she sticks a finger in my throat to gag me. And Gwen, if you're still out there somewhere, listening to this, please know, I love you so, so much. I remember that the first real instance came when we were driving somewhere, to dinner, the grocery store, I don't remember exactly, but we were in the car, I know that for sure. I'm driving sleepy, she said with a smile, and I piled into the passenger seat willingly. We played the radio and we drove, and Gwen commented about how strange it was that there was no traffic, and I told her not to jinx it. In a town, where a million people crowd a space meant for a third of that. I figured we must have entered another dimension or something. 
Maybe they're all dead, she said over the music. Don't get my hopes up, I called back. She cruised around a slow-moving minivan in the middle lane. It was early afternoon, and the sun was pointing directly in our eyes as we sped down the highway. And, when I closed my eyes to shield myself, I felt it. The warm, calming pull of sleep, of keeping my eyes shut for one more minute. Just one more quick second. Thwack. Gwen smacked me in the chest. Am I boring you or something? I rubbed my eyes and laughed, and she reached to turn the radio up, and then she screamed. I saw it. Just for that moment, the truck stopped in the lane in front of us. A shadow passed overhead, cloaking us in darkness for a moment, and it was gone just as fast. This was it. There was no slowing down. I closed my eyes and tensed every muscle as time crawled and I waited for the punch. I opened my eyes. Get up, sleepyhead. A pillow was tossed into my lap. Where was I? What happened? Why am I... How is... And then I remembered. The truck. Gwen, look out! I jumped off the couch and knocked into the coffee table sending me to the floor. My shin was on fire. My heart was pounding. Gwen's voice filled my head. Whoa, you okay there? Bad dream or something? Bad dream? No dream. I wasn't sleeping. We were in the car, on the highway. I was awake. I was awake. I was asleep. I was... Sleeping? I asked. Gwen cocked her head and raised an eyebrow. Uh, yeah, you conked out for a few seconds. I let you sleep while I put my shoes on. I could still feel the blood pump through my wrist. My heart slammed against my chest. It had felt so real. I could still see, still hear, still smell even, that car the road, the music. How could it all have been just a dream? I'm driving sleepy, Gwen said, smiling as she picked her keys up. Let's hope there's no traffic out there today. Hallucinations are common for folks with narcolepsy. It's similar to what people with sleep paralysis report. Tall, dark strangers at the foot of their bed, the corners of their bedrooms, I remember hearing a story about a guy who went mad from one of those hallucinations. Although, what's to say that he wasn't just a nut in the first place? Before bed, as a kid, I would see a shadow. It had no discernible face or body, no real features whatsoever. But the way that it would crawl across the ceiling used to curdle my blood and haunt me. Thankfully, I never had any trouble sleeping. It had been years since I'd seen anything before bed, and I think maybe the medication had something to do with that. That shapeless, faceless blob of a shadow had been absent from my dreams, or wakefulness, and I had almost forgotten about it entirely. But, wouldn't you know it, the same night, that very same one as the incident with Gwen and the car, my old friend made a reappearance. Gwen, I'd whispered. Gwen. Normally a light sleeper, my girlfriend didn't respond. It was black and grey, formless and spectral, and it no longer crawled, but glided across the ceiling as if it were a ballet. Gwen, Gwen. And then it spun and twisted, and curled and shrank. It shrank smaller and smaller and smaller, until it just disappeared against the drywall. And just as suddenly, it ballooned out of the ceiling and coated it like paint. And I squeezed my eyes shut, and I was out. It was a while before the second incident. Months, I think. 
Gwen had talked me into believing that I really was sleeping that day. And how could I even know, since I fall asleep all the time? It was morning, and the emails were piling in. Phones rang, and low, useless chatter sounded across the floor, and I nursed a hot cup of coffee, trying to ignore it all and get into the rhythm of the day. I clicked through some emails. Subject. Danksy report? Luke, send this to me, ASAP, okay? Subject. Office Halloween party. We still need someone to sign up for the candy corn. Any takers? I respond to the necessary. Bruise the less necessary. Ignore the droll and gossip and time wasters. Until I got to my last one. Subject. Sleep well? There was no sender visible. Do you know how many of these I get a week? Every week I'm sent some nonsense spam email about the latest pseudoscience narcolepsy cure. Just the previous week, I had learnt from one of these that key pressure points and four low monthly payments of $29.99 could cure me outright. So I bit. Might be a little fun to break up the day. I opened the email and my screen froze. I clicked the mouse. Nothing. Typed. No response. In the body of the email was just one small black period. I pushed the kill switch on my laptop and the period grew. I pushed against it harder, more forcefully. It grew and it grew larger and larger. It expanded, increasing in size until it filled the whole email, then the body, and then the screen. I felt my heart in my chest again, and I stood up, knocking over my coffee and letting out what I hoped was a shout, and then... nothing. It was dark. Someone had shut off the light. A power surge, I thought. It was a hot summer, and we'd had a couple already. I stood up, prepared to peer over the walls of my cube to ask a co-worker about it, but the desk was empty. I turned to my neighbour on the other side, and her desk too was unoccupied. Stepping out into the hall, I poked my head around the corner. Empty, empty, empty. Hello? Silence. I leaned back into my cube and sat down. I was about to get up again, when I heard the air conditioner in the building click off, and it hit me. It couldn't have been a power surge. I checked my watch. 8.03 p.m. Cold sweat formed on my forehead. I just got here. It was just morning. I just spilled my... The brown puddle I had formed was gone. My desk was dry, and my mug was gone. What the hell? What the... My voice trailed off in the darkness. My keys were, thankfully, still in my pocket. And without looking, I ran from the office building, taking the stairs two at a time, got into my car, and sped home. Gwen had greeted me at the door. Late night? I swallowed and nodded at a loss for words. I knew how crazy it would sound. I woke up. From what? Where had I been? How long had I been there? What the hell even happened? Gwen heated me up my dinner, and she was talking, but I didn't listen. Still caught to my own head, trying to process the day's lack of events. Next week we're... Jamie's gonna be... Thanksgiving plans. My ears pinged. Thanksgiving? I turned to Gwen, scrunching my eyebrows. Scrunching my eyebrows. Why are we planning out so far ahead? 
She scoffed and shook her head. I know a week is a lifetime for you, Luke, but some of us have to actually make plans. My head froze. What's the date? I didn't want to ask her. I really didn't. The 18th, Gwen said, and probably seeing the lack of understanding in my face, added, almost sarcastically, of November. I ate my dinner in silence. So, here we are, caught up to now. That's all the important stuff, at least. On Black Friday, I lost an hour. A week after that, I jumped ahead a day. Just last week, I found a watch that I'd lost in 2006. It was on my wrist the whole time. Gwen had said it had been on my wrist as long as she'd known me. I looked at the mirror yesterday morning, and my face looked younger, my skin smoother, than I remembered it ever being. There doesn't seem to be any pattern or rhythm to it. Sometimes the shadow is there. Sometimes it's not. I've been having trouble sleeping, actually. I haven't slept much, to be honest. But I also haven't been feeling tired. So that's gotten better, at least. I didn't know how to deal with it. But it was largely inconsequential. So I figured it would be okay. I seem to have gained about as much time back as I've lost so maybe there is some sort of reasoning to it. But then, this morning happened. Laughter rang out from the living room. Gwen, I assumed, watching something on TV. Christmas had come fast, but I hadn't passed it, so I was glad to be enjoying it. Hey babe, I said, entering the room. What are you watching? But, the couch was empty. Actually, the couch was gone. The apartment was dark. And, looking around, I noticed the furniture was all gone. Blue light came in through the window. A calm winter dusk. Gwen? I stepped outside into the chilly air and there was silence. No planes in the sky. No cars in the street. Hello? I went to check my watch, but my wrist was unadorned. Gwen? Anybody? My heart stopped in my chest. What year could it be? What time? Why is everyone gone? I walked into the street, and I sat down in the middle of it. A shiver crept up my spine and shook out through my limbs. Wake up, I tell myself. Wake up! I scream it down the road, and it echoed off similarly emptied buildings. The sun almost set, and my shadow stood in front of me, long and black. I walked towards it, but it remained out of reach. How long has it been? And where have I gone? I haven't slept in a few days, but maybe it's because there are no days here. The sun never sets, the moon never rises, the shadow remains where it is, in front of me at all times, no matter which way I face. I close my eyes and scream and try to startle myself awake. I must be sleeping somewhere, right? This must be all just a dream. I've considered climbing an empty building, walking out the window. Thwack. Maybe I'll wake up. I have to wake up, because I refuse to believe the alternative. Maybe this is awake, and I've been asleep this whole time. But, I'm feeling drowsy. My father worked for a human research company in the 70s and 80s 
before some organizations such as the IRB, Institutional Review Board for the Protection of Human Subjects in Research, and the Belmont Report could catch on. He retired and went on to live a nice, relaxing life with my mother, his wife of 30 years. After she died, his own health began to deteriorate and he willed his estate and possessions to me upon his passing. This ticked off my two other siblings, but that's mostly irrelevant because I intend to sell the house, property, and most of the items left to me and divide the money between us all. I guess that's why everything was left to me instead of split. I'm the responsible one. My father, Noah Foster, was an amazing man, and a very caring father to all of us. I don't think I ever once questioned his love for all of us. He never talked about what he used to do, only that he did help mankind in general, and he was glad to be out of it. The retirement check each month was hefty, and he never needed to look for another source of income. His savings is enormous, and if we are careful, we probably won't have to work again if we don't want to. But that's not why I'm here. See, I didn't enlist the help of my bitter siblings in the cleaning and cataloging of my parents' possessions. Or rather, my new possessions. So, when I found the box, I was alone. My father kept all his work-related things in the basement, which was always locked. One of those things willed to me, was a key ring with three keys. The brass key unlocked the basement door, and the silver key unlocked a large, floor-to-ceiling safe in the basement. That's where I found the boxes. Inside the safe were boxes of various dates and scribbled names, mostly faded, and some eaten by time to the point where it and its contents are little more than dust and decay. Some of the boxes I haven't opened yet. I'm honestly afraid of what I'll find. Their labels are obscure, and after reading what I found in the first box, I don't know if I'll dig any deeper. Let me share with you what I've discovered. The box itself is cardboard and heavy. It's bound in thick tape, and I wasn't worried the bottom would fall out as it had some sort of hard plastic wrapped around the base. It looked very commercial. The lid had a faded yellow tape with black bold letters and the words, sensitive documents, tampering with a seal without authorization is a criminal act. In marker on top were the words, human detachment project. I cut the seal these boxes were easily 30 plus years old, and they legally belonged to me. The contents from the top to bottom were as such. Four folders filled with scientific notes and some photographs of a family, not mine. A metallic box four inches wide and five inches tall that I am so far unable to open. A relatively new looking voice recorder. This one was most odd as it seems far more advanced than anything in this box should be. And last, at the very bottom, a record inside of a sleeve. No title or label. Now, I am going to relay everything notable I've read and heard. Maybe it'll help me understand what my father was working on, or why. Most of these names have been redacted, my father's including I'm guessing so, I don't know if these are his notes or someone else's. The Notes July 3rd, 1973 Redacted, compiling the incentive for the Human Detachment Project. In three years, CERN will publicly announce the completion of their Super Proton Synchrotron. The project was truly finished four days ago, and testing has already begun. After the failure of Apollo 13 and the subsequent lack of information yielded from Apollo 14, the administration has given the green light to the Daphne program which will bypass the exploration portion 
and moves straight to redacted on the moon's surface. These works double as isolation research and the test of space on the human psyche. Next note. Henry Tashfell has published his notes on the minimal group paradigm, developing the basis idea for the Human Detachment Project. Next. Redacted has been discovered in the Kola Superdeep Borehole. All proof of redacted has been removed and thus has confirmed that humans slash human-like can survive isolated for an unknown amount of time as redacted were oblivious to existence of life outside of the cavern. This concludes the incentive for the Human Detachment Project. That page was the first inside the top folder. The rest of the notes were newspaper clippings and typed slash handwritten notes about those events as well as other notable things around that time. Each one touching on this human detachment project. The second folder contained a picture of a family of four. There were no names on the photograph, but the next page had information. September 28th 1973. Most of the name had been redacted, except Stir. I believe this folder, or at least these notes were written or compiled by my father, Noah Foster. Compiling notes for the human detachment subjects. George Polk, 38, male. No history of mental illness or underlying health issues. Mary Polk, 36, female. No history of mental illness prone to migraines. William Polk, 12. No history of mental illness or underlying health issues. Deborah Polk, 5. Female. Underdeveloped mental capacity due to age. Ineligible for testing. Removed. Subject family offered the sum of $50,000 upon completion of the trials. Subject family agreed in the understanding that Deborah Polk be put under the care of outside family. The next item is a missing person poster dated October 10th, 1973. Deborah Polk, age 5, missing from grandmother's care since late September. The rest of the folder contained detailed medical records of each member of the family, apart from Deborah. The third folder is dated December 1974. The first page is handwritten and worn to the point where I can't read it. I skimmed a few pages, but most of the notes seem smudged or blurred. Towards the end of the folder, I can read parts of it. It appears to be a woman's handwriting. Phase 3 began early this morning. After keeping the subject family separated for six days of the week and together one, we then separated them into two weeks alone and one day together. Phase 3 consists of one month in isolation, followed by one hour of forced community time. This will continue until the final phase in six months. The remainder of the notes are observations of the three subjects. Inside the last folder are things I would have never believed people could do to another person. I almost don't want to share this in the event that it could harm my father's reputation, but I fully believe my father was not involved in the actual testing. I'm hoping to God the partial redacting in the previous folder was his part in the initial screening only. The first page of the folder is a printed email. July 5th, 1976. Charles Lynn compiling summary of the Human Detachment Project. The project officially ended two days ago after it was forgotten for several months slash years longer than it should have continued. The initial grant was for one year of human isolation in singular peoples only. The use of children and families were never approved. The following are excerpts from the various sources inside the Human Detachment Project. It has been deemed a success by some, and a massive failure by others. My supervisor, redacted, 
believes that this information can help thousands, although I personally fail to see how it could benefit anyone as the methods were little more than torture and the executors of the project have since been reprimanded. I will be taking a copy of my report to the head office in hopes of finding Deborah Polk. Next note. After extreme isolation, followed by increasingly limited community time, the father has attempted to kill subject's son on five separate occasions, each one with more extreme violent outbursts. Subject's mother attempted to lobotomize herself on two different ways, which resulted in the now constant restraint of her hands. Subject's son's mental health saw the fastest decline as he began to develop extreme split personality disorder. Next note. Subject's family was introduced to a looped recording of prayers spoken in Latin after the urging of Dr. Geddings. I believe this was more of a personal experiment than a necessary addition. Next note. Subject's son has now begun speaking fluently in Latin, even words that are not on the looped recording that has been played for 17 weeks straight. Subject's mother was found dead in a room. Her hands remained bound, but bruising and a crushed windpipe were the cause of death. Subject's father claims to have killed her because, quote, she begged me to. Neither subject had seen each other in over three months. Subject's father killing subject's mother deemed impossible. Subject's son was found in the community room. His room was still locked, and as there are no doors or windows, it is unclear how he escaped. He was found standing in front of subject's mother's now empty room, whispering to her in Latin, holding a small metallic box. Origin unknown. Subject's father was released into a sealed room with two interviewers for final assessment before release. Upon being told he would be released, Subject's father took his own life with a pen of an interviewer. His last words were, Don't make me leave. You can't make me leave. Subject's son remains in isolation. It is unclear for how long. Interview recorded shows clear psychosis and mental breakdown. I will be sending copies of this to various heads. The cruelty and forced isolation of these people is far beyond criminal neglect. The remaining papers are the medic reports and death certificates of George and Mary Polk. The dates are redacted. The last thing in the box is the voice recorder. I had to pick up some batteries before I could listen to it. It went as follows. Interviewer. Do you know where you are? Son. I am at redacted. This is a long redaction. I think he said the actual address. Also, his voice is quite deep for a youth. Interviewer. And, and why do you think that's where you are? Son. I just know. If we can determine that you are healthy, we would like to release you. I don't want to leave. Why not? I am not one of them outside. I am inside. We are going to release you. We need to see how you react around others. I don't want to leave. The audio breaks up a few times here. Before it cuts off. That's everything I know about the Human Detachment Project. I don't know what's inside the small box, and I have a pretty good idea about what's on the record. I'm afraid to dig deeper. I have a few more boxes with various titles, such as The Snakeskin Experiment, Operation Stopwatch, and a few others. One box in particular makes me nervous. It's double taped and has the words failed experiments on the top. I have one key left on the key ring, and I don't know if it goes to something else inside of one of these boxes or not, but I feel he left it to me for a reason. I really don't want to go through more of these boxes, but there are just so many. 
And why would he have these? Why wouldn't they be somewhere more secure than his basement all this time? For me, when I was a child, there was nothing quite like the feeling of stepping into a local blockbuster. My father worked in the film industry, and so from an early age, I was subjected to the world of cinema and its finer workings. Stepping through the sliding automatic doors and being greeted with the sight of any movie my young brain could have desired was captivating. I still have fond memories of walking up and down the aisles looking at VHS covers, just waiting for a title or cover art to pop out and interest me enough to want to watch it. For me, it was complete creative freedom, and for my parents, it was a cheap way to keep their child quiet for a few hours. I loved those VHS tapes that came in those clunky plastic covers that had a glossy shine and would snap open. I would get older, but the tradition never changed. Every Friday night, my parents would take me to Blockbuster, or my mum would if dad was working. I would pick out two movies, one for Friday night and one for Saturday. My taste evolved as I got older, of course. Cartoon dinosaurs faded away, replaced by action stars and slashers, and sometimes more lifelike dinosaurs. Eventually, Blockbuster started renting out video games, and that for me was, sorry for this, a game changer. As the well of teenage emotions started filling up, movie nights with my folks transformed into junk food fueled nights of gaming, desperately trying to experience everything the game had to offer before I had to return it. I'm sure others could see the downfall of blockbusters happening as the market began to prefer shipped products and digital media. For me though, the change happened within just a month. My trips to the store was less frequent as I got on in years and started to explore other avenues of acquiring media, but I would still make the occasional trips. I almost felt guilty if enough time passed without me visiting. On one of my visits, I had seen several deals were taking place with big signs eccentrically stating new promotions. One of the telltale signs of declining business. Something just trying to recoup losses. With my next visit, the lights are off and the shelves are being cleared. And that marked the end of my tradition. Years would go by and I would find myself following in my father's footsteps. My innate love for cinema and the knowledge my dad passed on to me guided me into a field of filmmaking. Silly little slasher indie films shot on a camcorder with my friends. Movies that I thought had a deep and meaningful message that I can only describe now as pretentious nonsense. I started picking up speed after college and was starting to get some semblance of notoriety in the film community. Fame had far from struck but I was a ways off from where my father ended his career, but I was content. The visits to Blockbuster had become distant but pleasant memories, the kind I would recall on bleak, rainy days or sleepless nights. As far as I was concerned, every Blockbuster had shut down and the franchise was just gone. One night, I had lamented this to my friend while I was editing one of my passion projects. I couldn't help but think how cool it would be to have a movie I had a hand in making resting on one of those shelves. The bargain bin at Walmart just doesn't have the same appeal. She was borderline jubilant to explain that there was still a blockbuster up and running, that it even had a social media handle. Focusing on my project became nearly impossible as we dived deeper into plans to visit the location. It wasn't nearly as far of a trip as I thought. It was surprising I hadn't heard of this place living so close. While I waited for the trip, I finished my movie and burned it onto a DVD, 
even got one of my friends to do the cover art. My movie was going on that shelf, even if it was just for a moment. I would mark the memory. The day came in seemingly no time, and with a full bag of junk food, we headed out. The drive only took about a day, but I couldn't have been giddier. Some part of me deep down was nervous when I pulled into the parking lot. It sounds silly, but it was like seeing an old friend after years apart. Like I didn't know what to say or talk about, despite having a whole life of experiences. Pulling into the parking lot paled in comparison to walking through the doors. This surge of nostalgia and novelty washed over me and I was thrown into the days of my youth. Movies lined the walls and snacks sat by the checkout. Even the smell felt familiar. How can something like a smell stay so consistent after all those years? We spent hours in there, talking with the staff and rummaging through various aisles, looking at movies that we'd never heard of. The place was pretty busy too, just people shopping for movies or taking selfies. It was so surreal, and once the nostalgia started to fade, it felt like it always had, and I liked that. Before we knew it, the sun was starting to go down, and the store had become empty, apart from the manager and us. We had talked to the manager quite a bit, and even got to gush about the film we were making, so she allowed us to stay while she started closing up. The front doors locked, the lights dimmed, and we continued to chat while she tallied up the day's work. The store took on a different atmosphere once the traffic had vanished and we were left alone. The hum of the overhanging fluorescence and the blinking red light from the security camera behind the counter pulled at my attention. I eyed the red light as it went on and off. Does that record all night? I asked the woman, shuffling through paper bills. She replied that it was certainly supposed to. Looking at the black lens of the camera, I could make out the faintest outline in its reflection. Something off. Then, the blinking red light stopped. I looked back down. I told the manager that the blinking had ceased. She didn't move for a moment, and then looked up at the camera. When it failed to blink, she quickly rose up from her seat and told us to follow her. The words were horrid and almost felt like we were being scolded, but we did so anyway. We made our way into an office that was closed off from the rest of the store. In the room was a desk, a safe, and various piles of paper documents. There was also a set of overhanging TVs that were displaying the live camera feed. When I looked at the camera feeds, I was surprised to see that someone else was still in the store. When I attempted to tell the manager about the person, she just replied that she already knew about him. The manager was moving papers all around while mumbling to herself. She was saying, Where is it? over and over. Just under the TV screens, there was an old VHS player and a series of wires connected to it that ran into small holes in a square and metal panel. Interrupting her chanting, the manager told us to let her know if the man on the TV started to move. Staring at the old man, dressed in khakis and a polo shirt, I was confused about how I hadn't seen him after the doors were locked. I could see my friend's eyes were glued to the feed, so I backed away, just enough to see outside of the door. Shifting my gaze between the interior of the store and the feed on the TV, I felt myself let out a chuckle. I think the feed is broken, I exclaimed to the manager as I looked out into the rest of the store. There's no one there. He needs to be recorded, 
the manager replied, almost completely ignoring me. I felt a prickle of curiosity. That was when a car drove by, and its headlights flooded into the store, cascading beams through the shelves. I heard my friend exclaim that he could see the light of the car caused in the camera, that the feed was live. She had even seen my shadow shifting when I was looking back and forth from the screen and store. Keeping my eyes fixated on the camera feed, my wonder shifted to uncertainty and spiralled into horror when the old man stepped forward. His movements were rigid and shaky, causing artifacts in the feed. It was like he was thawing out so his muscles weren't capable of smooth movements. My voice shook, but I told the manager about his advance, and at the same time, she exclaimed that she found what she was looking for. A small keychain that held just one bronze key. The camera feed started to fizzle, like a wave of static had corrupted it. The lights within the store started to brighten, and the soft glow they had during the day shifted to a harsh and obnoxious white. The man took another step as the manager plunged the key into a slot on the metal panel. I took a glance out the office door, doing my best to shield my eyes from the light and get a look at what was out there. Though I couldn't see the old man with my own eyes, I could tell where he was. Space where he existed on camera, was distorted. It was like the blocky and out of focus textures on a poorly rendered video game, and with each step he made forward, the effects radius expanded. The carpet of the store that was under where his feet would be started to take on the same static effect you'd get from a satellite TV. Looking back to the manager, I watched her messing around with a collection of wires, this time whispering, please, to herself. When she was satisfied with the work, she stepped back and looked up at the TVs. The old man was still stepping forward, spreading his distortion into our world like a virus, but it became apparent he was slowing down. Slowly, he and the effects he brought with him started to halt their progress. The manager let out a heavy sigh as the bizarre effects around the man began to dissipate. She looked at both of us, surely noticing our awestruck expressions. He needs to be recorded, she repeated. This time, those words were more of a threat. The nostalgia in the blockbuster was unmatched for me. Even after that experience, I was able to get the picture from my DVD sitting on the shelf. When you walk into that store, you might feel like your younger self again, like you are lost to time. In that store, there is a being that is truly lost to time though, one that needs to be recorded or he'll start to catch up. That store needs to remain running. A careful watch needs to remain on the mechanics of that VHS player. I'd hate to imagine what would happen if a being like that was able to roam free. I loved visiting that store, but I don't see myself ever going back. Some things should stay in the past. Even now, as I look at the picture of my DVD sitting on the shelf, I can see the old man. It's just his head, peeking over the line of movies, but I can see his face clear as day. The brown liver spots and ghostly white hair, his bright and almost unnatural yellow eyes, and a smile, a beaming smile. One that knows it has all the time it needs, because even the last blockbuster will have to close someday.
Do I have a drinking problem? Guilty as charged. Am I one of the best paranormal investigators to ever exist? Probably. I still remember the first time I encountered a spirit. It was prom night and the first time I ever got actually drunk. I was throwing up in the restroom when suddenly I could hear sobbing coming from inside another stall. I wiped my mouth and turned to look around. I almost jumped when I saw her, but I immediately caught myself, only allowing a small gasp to escape from my lips. If I hadn't puked it out already, the shock would have sobered me up by then. There, in the stall, right across from me, was a girl. The lid of the toilet was down, and she was sitting on it, hanging her head. Her long dark hair obscuring her face, but by the sounds she was making and the shaking of her shoulders, it was clear to see that she was the one crying. I cleared my throat. Hi there, I stammered out, not quite sure what to say. I didn't hear you come in, you startled me. I let out a nervous chuckle. No reply. I took a few steps towards her, looking her up and down. It was hard to see in the partial darkness of the room, but she wasn't dressed up for prom. Her clothes were simple and kind of old-fashioned, 80s style. I was pretty sure I hadn't seen her around before. Uh, are you alright? Is there anything I can help you with? Anything I could do? I asked gently. Again, no response. Just sobs. Would you like to talk about it? I offered. It was then that I noticed that something was wrong with the way she was holding her arms. The palms of her hands were pointing upwards and it looked like she was trying to keep them away from her shirt. I took another step toward her, and that's when I saw it. The blood slowly dripping from her hands. She had slit her wrists. Oh my god, what have you done? I gasped. We, we, we need to get you to the hospital. Come on, get up. I bent down and reached out to grab her shoulder to help her to her feet. But my hand went straight through her. My eyes widened in terror. It couldn't be. I slowly reached out once again to touch her. But again, there was nothing there. It was then that I realized it. The girl slowly lifted her head, but before I could see her face, she vanished. Disappeared into thin air. I stumbled and landed on the cold bathroom floor. It took me a while to completely comprehend the whole situation. The first thing I did was look her up, and indeed, there had been a student of my high school who had ended their life in one of the restrooms in 1986. Her name was Pamela. I even found a picture of her. I immediately recognized her. I had seen a ghost. I couldn't believe it at first, but when it all began to sank in, I started conducting some experiments. I visited tons of allegedly haunted locations just to find out if I could see other deceased people, but nothing ever happened. Then, I tried recreating certain elements of that evening. I tried going back to the school's restroom, but they threw me out. Apparently former students aren't allowed to come by unannounced. Sometime later, I finally had the idea to try out drinking like I had that night. And, what can I say? It worked. I started reorientating my career. If I learn one thing during the time I've been doing this job, is that most people in this business 
are fake. A lot of them don't even believe in ghosts. They just use some cheap tricks and make up semi-heartwarming stories to make profit from the mourning loved ones of the recent deceased. I've met a few really nice people though too. People who actually want to help. But that's not what this is about. This is about the most horrifying experience I ever had. It was two years ago and I was still pretty new to the job. I had gotten a call by a middle-aged couple who wanted me to contact their twin daughters who had disappeared two months prior. The disappearance had been ruled a kidnapping case and investigations were still going on. The parents were distraught. They had told me over the phone that they had never really believed in the paranormal, psychics and all that, but that they were desperate to find their children. I felt terribly sorry for them and immediately got on my way. It took me about three hours to get to their place, including the small detour to get booze. I arrived to find a beautiful, large house that might have looked like a warm family home if it weren't for the strange, dark atmosphere surrounding the place. The closer I got to the building, the worse it became. The air was cold, too cold. It all felt so distant and unfamiliar. I remember thinking it was weird. I wasn't even drunk yet. The lady who welcomed me in looked pretty normal, except for the large bags under her eyes and a tear-swollen face. She frowned in confusion as she glanced down at the bottle. Good evening, are you the... Yes, that's me, I quickly replied. Oh, uh, come in then, she said in a brittle voice. She led me over to the living room, where her husband sat in a large table reading a newspaper. He looked just as downtrodden as his wife. As he stood up to greet me and shook my hand, I could clearly see that he harbored some doubts about my work. I didn't blame him though. I guess the bottle of vodka in my hand didn't help me seem very convincing. Mr. and Mrs. Davis, I am very sorry about what happened to your daughters. I am not one to make false promises, but I will try my best to help. Could you tell me a little more about them? Mr. Davis cleared his throat. Missy and Lucy. We named them Missy and Lucy. We wanted them to have similar sounding names because... His voice broke off. They are identical twins, Mrs. Davis chimed in. They're really clever, good at school. Mrs. favorite color is green and Lucy's is blue. They turned 11 not too long ago. I... I don't know what to do. Tears began welling up in her eyes. I just want them back. Her husband leaned over to hug her. Turning back to me, he added, We don't know if they're still alive. So maybe calling you here is just a waste of time too. The police seem to think so as well. But at this point, we're just desperate for answers. No matter the way. We are open to try anything, so just tell us what we need to do. I remember frowning slightly at his statement. Why would they tell the police about me? I figured I was overthinking it and shrugged it off. So, this might seem kind of weird to you, but I have a bit of a unique method of working. I already asked you to find a different place to stay for a few hours over the phone, just for the time that I'm here. Are you ready to leave then? Uh, yes. Mr. Davis replied. He looked like he wanted to add something, but I interrupted him. I already know you locked away your valuables. I wasn't planning on stealing anything. The couple exchanged awkward glances, but Mrs. Davis quickly said, Also, the upstairs bathroom is under renovation, 
If you need to use the bathroom, please use the one on this floor. Got it, I replied, placing my bottle on the table. Oh, and we're going to need a glass, and some orange juice if you've got some. It didn't take a lot of time for the vodka's effect to set in. I don't hold the strong stuff very well, so it was just a matter of, I don't know, half an hour? Mr. and Mrs. Davis had gone off to see a movie. Another thing that struck me as sort of odd. Lord knows that if my kids were missing, I wouldn't be able to focus on anything, let alone a two-hour movie. I figured... They probably needed some kind of distraction though. The last two months had probably been hell for them. As the warm feeling began to spread in my stomach, the air around me seemed to grow even heavier. I found myself becoming susceptible. I leaned back in my chair and waited. There was an air of sorrow, of pain in this room. It was so strong that it felt legitimately oppressive. But there was something else. Rage. An underlying touch of cruelty. I could feel it. I slowly got up from a chair and placed my empty glass on the floor. I hadn't drunken enough for any of my motor skills to be impaired. I walked around the living room, trying to determine the centre of the strange energy. Suddenly, I heard a voice high-pitched and soft. It was little more than a whisper, but quite clearly the voice of a child. Upstairs. I spun around to see the wavering, unclear outline of two girls standing behind me, right next to the living room door. I swallowed down my surprise. So, they were dead indeed. But why were they here? Did it mean that the kidnappers had killed them inside the house and then taken away their bodies? Missy? Lucy? I asked, trying to suppress the quivering of my own voice. Needle and thread. They spoke in unison this time, their voice just as fragile as their flickering silhouette. I squinted my eyes. Something about the way they were standing was off. So close, right next to one another. But I just couldn't put my finger on it. Their image was just too faint, like a faded drawing. And suddenly, they were gone. Wait, I shouted. Then I remembered. Upstairs. Up the stairs, up the stairs, up the stairs. My mind seems to scream as I rush to climb the steps to the second floor. I looked up just in time to catch another glimpse of the twins standing atop the staircase, staring down at me before they vanished out of sight once again. Lucy, where are you? Missy, I yelled out, looking around frantically as I came to a halt on the second floor's hallway. Then, I felt it. For just a split second, I could feel the cold lips of one of the dead children right next to my ear. I didn't dare to turn my head in fear of scaring her away. I stood as still as a statue as she whispered two words. The bathroom. The bathroom. A terrible suspicion began to grow within me. Renovations. Renovations my ass. I rushed along the hallway, hurriedly checking each room. I passed the parents' bedroom, a room filled with toys, which I assumed had belonged to the twins, and another staircase. There was an additional floor above this one, which is probably where the twins' actual bedrooms were located. But my destination lay at the far end of the hallway. As I ran towards the door, the hallway seemed to stretch itself to a surreal length. The door was locked. Of course it was. 
the room was under renovations after all. I kicked, I banged, I threw myself against it until the weak aged doorframe finally gave in. To my surprise, the bathroom looked relatively normal. There was nothing off about it at first glance. I looked around, searched every corner, nothing, absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. Oh damn, I muttered. I would have a hard time explaining this to Mr. and Mrs. Davis. But then, there they were again, standing in the middle of the room, staring at me with large, pleading eyes. This time, I could clearly see what was wrong with them. Their bodies. They were attached at the sides. The rags they were wearing were bloodstained and dirty. It took a few seconds for the realization to set in, and when it did, my blood ran cold. Needle and thread. No, 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 no. Please don't tell me that's how you died, I whispered. One of the girls gently tapped the bathroom tile she was standing on with a bare foot. I looked down, and my eyes widened. There was a set of tiles in the floor that looked much newer than the other ones. They were cleaner and didn't have any scratches yet. The plaster holding them together was fresher too. I took out my pocket knife and hastily began scraping away at it. The twins still standing over me, watching. I don't know how long it took me. My knife went dull pretty soon. I found a screwdriver in one of the cabinets and kept at it until finally I had scratched off enough for the tile to be loose. Using the blade of my knife as a lever, I lifted the tile. I gagged as I stared into the empty eye sockets of the decomposing head underneath. The stench that wafted out of the hole was almost worse than the sight itself. I looked up at the sad, watery eyes of the twins. They'd sat down in front of me. The girl on the left reached out to touch the remains of the face I'd uncovered. That's me, she breathed. I felt tears welling up in my eyes. Who, who did this to you? I already knew the answer but I had to hear it from them. Daddy does bad things, the girl on the right said softly. But mommy's worse, the girl on the left added. I nodded and pulled out my cell phone, dialed 911, and upon being asked what my emergency was, I simply said, I found the two missing girls. After hanging up, I looked back at the girls. They said they're going to be here in ten minutes. Would you like to tell me what exactly happened? The twins exchanged pensive glasses before the one on the right spoke up. Mummy didn't give us anything to eat. We were hungry. We wanted out. We tried to flee, but they caught us. Mummy was really mad at us. She said we wouldn't go anywhere again, ever. Needle and thread, needle and thread. We sat in silence for another eight minutes or something. I looked at them, and they looked back at me. They didn't look all that sad anymore. Suddenly, the silence was broken by a loud knocking at the front door. I got up. That must be them. Are you girls going to be fine? I asked as their features began flickering and slowly dissolving in front of my eyes. They didn't respond, and before I knew it, they were gone. I quickly wiped away my tears and rushed downstairs to open the door. It took quite some time to explain everything to the police. 
I think the official statement says something along the lines of, the investigator found the corpses by accident. Nonsense. I don't really care though. They can believe whatever they want. The Davises were arrested pretty much on the spot, and their confession was just as harrowing as expected. Apparently, Mrs. Davis had some sort of mental illness that caused her to have sudden anger outbursts, and Mr. Davis would gladly let his frustrations out on his daughters. When they had given their children nothing to eat for two entire days, the girls attempted to run away. They didn't get very far, though. Needle and thread. It's these three words that have never left my mind since. This was their cause of death. I don't know how long they survived sewn together, but it couldn't have been long. When they died, their parents hid the corpses under the bathroom tiles and renewed them. The cops hadn't paid attention to them when they had searched the house. Apparently, the Davises wanted to play the role of the grieving parents perfectly, which is why they told everyone that they would be calling a paranormal investigator. They hadn't expected me to find anything. Of course they hadn't. They looked up the one who, out of everyone in this business, seemed least legitimate. Seeing as I explain my methods on my website, I'm not really surprised they'd think I was some kind of crazy weirdo. Well, not everyone believes in ghosts. I don't know what you were expecting when I said I'd tell you about the creepiest thing I ever saw. Probably a demon or something. If so, I'm sorry to disappoint. It's kind of funny though, isn't it? In the end, the worst thing I ever encountered when communicating with the souls of the deceased were two very alive humans. As for the twins, I really hope they're doing alright. I have a feeling they're fine. I think the idea came to us after Mr. Garibaldi's funeral. He was our junior high school gym teacher, a lovable nut job, and I think just about everybody liked him. We went to the service, of course, and as we passed by the excavator in the graveyard, I remember Nate saying something like, being buried alive is my worst fear. We stopped and peered down the hole. It wasn't finished yet. The ground more or less frozen solid, but they were about halfway done. I could see Nate shuddering as he carefully glanced over the edge. I think Frank noticed his reaction too, and he gave me a weak nod as I raised my eyebrows. Now, it's important to know that Nate was a real prankster. He loved getting one over on us, Frank and me and he'd been taking great pleasure in doing so for the better part of our lives. The three of us go back all the way to kindergarten, and I remember very vividly the first time he pranked me. He pulled out the chair from under me as I sat down, and I ended up sprawling on the floor helplessly. Since then, his pranks have evolved into more sophisticated shenanigans, of course, like bubble wrap in my car, or shaving Frank's head while he slept, or sporadically hacking into our social media accounts to change our profile pictures. Harmless stuff like that. But, we were getting pretty sick of it. It was like he believed the prankster persona to be the cornerstone of his identity. Like he'd ceased to exist without it. Like his entire life revolved around screwing people over. It was getting pretty damn tiresome, I'll tell you that much. So, Frank and I had been discussing it for weeks. How to prank him back. How to make him realize just how bad it can make you feel. Because talking to him about it didn't yield anything. He'd just make excuses or call us pussies or whatever. And eventually just change the subject entirely. So that was that then. We couldn't resolve it peacefully. We had to hit him back. And hard. So, I came up with a plan. 
It was pretty straightforward, but the genius was in the simplicity of it. We'd construct a makeshift coffin, basically a wooden box, get him blackout drunk, no hard feet, and place him in it when he passed out. We'd nail the thing shut, shovel a handful of dirt around for that extra flare of authenticity, and wait patiently until he woke up, eventually freaking the hell out. Then we'd open the box, after letting him sweat for a few minutes, and do the old point and laugh. It was the perfect prank. Correction, it would have been the perfect prank if we had just followed the plan. And to be fair, everything started great. We threw a party at Frank's, and I made sure to spike Nate's drink whenever he wasn't paying attention. At midnight, he was wasted. And to top it off, we got him to take an extra few shots just to make sure he'd reached the wanted level of dead drunk. After the party cleared out, we carried him to the garage where we had set up the box, placed him in there, nailed the lid shut and shoveled some dirt around him. It was perfect. Now, all we had to do was wait. But, it soon got dreadfully boring. So we went back to the house and kept drinking until we both just passed out. I woke up with a terrible hangover 12 hours later. All I could think about was getting home, so that's just what I did. I left Frank snoring on the couch and spent the rest of the day trying not to move at all. As far as I know, that's exactly what Frank did as well. Yes, you guessed it. We completely forgot about Nate. Look, it was a pretty bad thing to do, I know. Not the coffin thing, he totally had that coming. But forgetting we put him in there in the first place? Yeah, definitely bad. I was lounging on my couch when everything suddenly came back to me and I immediately panicked and called Frank. Asshole wasn't responding, probably still passed out. So I rushed over there, heading straight for the garage. The box was open and empty. I let out a sigh of relief. He probably kicked the thing open and got out. No big deal. But upon closer inspection, I noticed something else. Vomit, feces, pee, blood and claw marks on the lid. Holy hell, he must have totally lost it in there. There's no telling how long he'd been trapped, but it didn't really matter. The sense of horror, confusion, and utter dread he must have experienced. It made my stomach churn just thinking about it. He had to be furious at us. I tried calling him over and over, but got no response. I sent him several messages asking if he was okay, and made sure to apologize profusely but I don't think he even read them. I got Frank to do the same, but nothing. It was like he was ignoring us, and with good reason, some would claim. I had a class with him the following Monday, and I was truly dreading having to face him. What would he do? How would he react? Whatever he did, I knew I deserved it. But... Not knowing what state of mind he was in was torture. I can't really describe how I felt when I saw him approaching me in the hallway. I froze. Just stood there, trembling. Sup, Paul? He smiled. You alright? What? Y yeah, I stuttered. You? Yeah, I'm good. He gave me a pat on the back. Sick prank you guys pulled. Yeah, I said, hesitantly. You're not angry? Hell no, he laughed. That was epic. It was weird. It was the opposite of what I was expecting. But maybe it had worked. Maybe he finally understood how it felt 
being on the other side of a prank. Yet, there was something about him. Something strange. Like, he was too happy. No one should be happy after what we had pulled. But, I don't know. The week went by fine. I mean, there was nothing really out of the ordinary. The days just passed, you know. Nate seemed much calmer. More composed, maybe. But still, the same old Nate in most ways. The weekend eventually came, and Frank wanted us all to go out drinking. I guess he was still feeling guilty about what we did, and wanted everything to get back to normal again. I declined. The memories from last weekend still way too fresh in my mind. Nate declined too. He didn't say why, but he seemed pretty chill about it. I didn't do much that weekend. Played some games, hung out with my brother, just chilled. I couldn't stop thinking about that box though. The horror Nate had to go through. It just kept coming back to me. Kept haunting me. It didn't add up. He should be livid. But he wasn't. He didn't show any emotion. Like he was dead inside. Sunday morning, I got the call from Nate's mom. She wondered if I'd seen him. He'd been gone since Thursday. No one had heard from him. They were getting worried. He'd been horribly depressed, locking himself in his room, refusing to talk to anyone. Did I know why? What could have happened to him? What was going on with him? I couldn't tell her didn't have the guts to admit it to her. We'd broken him, Frank and me. Mostly me. I slouched down in the couch, feeling like an utter piece of crap. What was going on with him? How depressed was he? Could he be... suicidal? No, not Nate. Or... My phone rang. It was Frank. I really didn't want to talk to him, wasn't feeling it, but he just kept calling and calling and calling. What the hell do you want, Frank? I finally answered. Paul? Paul? His voice was barely audible and the connection was horrible. Frank? I asked. What's going on? Where are you? You gotta help me, Paul, he yelled. Help me! Calm down, Frank, I said. What the hell is going on? His voice was high-pitched and desperate, and I'm pretty sure he was crying, whimpering. I'm buried, Paul, he screamed hysterically. I'm in the coffin. Wait, what? What coffin? Please, get me out. The connection worsened, and I could barely hear him. Where are you? I'm not alone. His voice started fading. Mr. Garibaldi is down here with me. The connection finally broke. I tried calling him back several times, but only got his voicemail. What did he mean Mr. Garibaldi was there with him? Mr. Garibaldi was dead. Six feet under. Oh no. My phone buzzed. It was a text message. I looked at the sender, fumbled the phone, my hands trembling, my heart racing, adrenaline pumping. It was from Nate. See you at the funeral, bro. Nothing about our move to Merkwood Drive excited me. I remember how my parents had dropped the news on me last minute, leaving me with a little less than a week to even process it. A strategic move that made me hate them more than I ever thought I could. My dad's new job wanted him right away, they said, and it was a last minute decision. I wasn't so gullible that I bought that nonsense. I knew that you don't just land a new job and buy a new house all within a week. 
They could have given me more time. They should have given me more time. Anyway, Merck would drive. I remember how my stomach sank as we pulled into the street and I got the first look at my new home. The house was what my parents called a fixer-upper. It just needs a coat of paint, my father said, with his usual self-assurance, giving his words their own coat of bright, happy paint, trying to make me believe this place was something I'd ever choose. The house looked like it loomed forward to peer down at me, judging me unworthy of its shelter. The grass out front sprung up in uneven, tattered clusters, and it was pockmarked with the ugly patches of dry, barren soil. A dilapidated swing squatted in the corner nearest the home. Its frame rusted, and the twine suspending the seat frayed and threatening to snap at any moment. My mom turned and looked at me with bright eyes as the car pulled into the driveway. Exciting, isn't it? I kept staring out the window so she wouldn't see my face getting hot and my eyes watering. I opened the door and slid out of my seat as soon as the engine turned off. I shivered for the cold and my feet sank into the cushions of moss that dwelled on the drive like postules. The air was bitter with the smell of wood smoke and a fire from somewhere nearby, and I could hear the pinching shrieks of cats fighting up the street. My dog, Sebastian, brushed against my leg as he hopped out of the car and followed a scent trail onto the grass. He stretched his legs and looked at me with eager eyes, bowing his head and spreading his paws to play. At least we'd be getting used to this new house together. The inside of the house was cleaner than I anticipated, but it still smelt damp and felt like it had been abandoned for years. It was just as cold inside as it was out. Dad dug our jackets out of the back of the car. We just need to get the heating going, he said lightly as he handed me mine. This place will be toasty in no time. Sebastian came and sat beside me on the bottom step of the staircase, leaning against my leg and watching my parents walk around the room, finding things to celebrate about our new home. He looked up at me in a way that said he wasn't happy either. Oscar, why don't you look upstairs? Mom asked me. I shrugged. An empty bedroom isn't the best way to lift your spirits. At last, my despondency sank in, and she looked at me with pity. Why don't you take Sebastian out for a while? Apparently there's a nice park down the road, with some good walking routes. Oh, it's so convenient here, Dad chipped in. You can walk to school in no time. Great. It was even closer to the only place I hated more than this. I found Sebastian's things in the car, and took him for a walk. Merck would drive was disturbingly quiet. Not just the kind of quiet that's typical for a Sunday morning. I mean, it felt like half of the houses were empty. There was no noise from televisions, no music, nobody tending to their gardens or outside talking to neighbours. A morbid stillness blanketed the world. I shivered, though not for the cold this time and drew my jacket in closer. The park would have been a disappointment if I had expected anything. It was empty, predictably. A patch of rubbery tarmac with a sudden sandpit and some neglected metal frames with sunbleach paint peeling off them. A seesaw squeaked in the breeze, and a pair of crows took turns pecking at a food wrapper that someone had left on a bench. I walked on, past the park, to the tree line beyond. The crow cocked their heads and peered at me with glassy eyes before they returned to their meal. The grass closer to the tree line was peculiarly short and neat, like it had barely grown. I can't imagine anybody came down this way to maintain it often, and if they did, I couldn't understand why they would focus on one side more than the other. 
but I suppose I just subconsciously added it to the list of reasons that my new home felt out of place to me. A dirt path had been gouged through the grass, leading up to a wall of sycamore trees that flanked the frontmost face of the woods like a line of cracked, time-worn sentries. Something seemed off, and when a gust of wind forced the grass to bow and rifle through the leaves, I realised what it was. The leaves. It was around early winter that we moved house, and by then, most of the trees had lost their foliage. But this forest was lush and green, and as though it were midsummer. I craned my neck to inspect the canopy with wonder as I passed beneath the branches, and I couldn't spot a single leaf that had so much as a speck of orange or brown. Green, healthy, defiant of the winter chill, frozen in time. My wonder turned to discomfort, and my impressionable young mind started spinning comic book-esque thoughts of barrels of radioactive waste buried deep beneath the soil, their glowing green contents snaking up the root systems and mutating the trees to give them unnatural, everlasting life. What if I got radiation sickness? Or somebody shot us for being on government property whilst trying to cover up the secret? Sebastian barked at a squirrel, and I was yanked out of my daydream with a start. I laughed to myself, watching him circle the tree that his prey had escaped up. It's just a forest, I thought. Don't be stupid. I picked a direction at random and started walking, clicking my tongue to signal my friend to follow. He ploughed through the undergrowth, looking back at me with a wide, open mouth that I, like most dog owners, like to think of as a smile. Maybe this place wouldn't be so bad after all. Dad said the internet connection at the house will be up and running in a couple of days, and I could bring Sebastian here for walks. I could put up with the hermit neighbours. I could get used to this. I heard something nearby, but I couldn't figure out where it came from. It was a kind of satisfied sigh, like the kind that follows a long drink to quench your thirst. I thought that perhaps I just imagined it, but Sebastian had paused with his paw half raised off the ground, his ears alert as he looked around for its source. I stood still, waiting for it again, but nothing came. I shook it off and continued on our walk tucking my hands in my pockets as the winter chill deepened. Several minutes later, there was another sound, and this one was no mistake. A deep rumble, punctuated and staccato, seemed to come from several places in the trees above at once. It was like a growl and a laugh rolled into one unnatural sound. It made Sebastian's fur stand on edge, and he responded with his own growl. All of my apprehension came flooding back, and my fear drew the cold deeper into my bones. I stopped in my tracks, scanning the trees. Come on, boy, I said, my shivering jaw making my words quaver. Time to go home. I turned, and my breath caught. The dirt path was gone. That was impossible. I had just been following it. In fact, I was still standing on it. I looked down and then to my left and right as I realised I now stood at the centre of a junction. The path splitting off to my left, to my right and onwards behind me all roots stretching deep into a forest that had inexplicably increased its footprint a hundredfold in a single moment. How in the hell? I said, looking at my dog as if he could give me an answer. Maybe it was wishful thinking, 
but I swear, he looked puzzled too. Another satisfied sigh, far down the new path to my right. It sounded distant, and yet so incredibly loud and crisp for such a gentle sound, carrying through the air like an arrow sailing through unfettered space. A voice spoke, high and thin, like it was mocking an adoring owner. This way, doggy. Sebastian snarled and bolted, chasing the source of the voice down the path. I swore and chased after him, desperately calling him back to me. Sebastian, stop! Stop! I began bellowing any command I could think of. Treat, Sebastian! This way! Good boy! Look what I've got here! It was no good. He was outpacing me further and further every second, and with a defeated whimper, I sank to my knees, my face burning with wind chill. His black and white form kept racing down the path. He jumped a log, weaved through undergrowth, and finally disappeared. I stared at the place I had last seen him, wondering what on earth I could do now. His bark echoed from deep in the trees, and he was gone. I knelt there, staring absently for several long minutes, then got to my feet and began to follow. I had no hope of catching my dog unless he came back, but doing something was better than nothing. I surveyed my surroundings as I walked and realized then how flat the forest seemed. Apart from occasional saplings or fell logs covered in moss and ivy, there were no features or landmarks, just endless forest in every direction, including the way before me, where the dirt path seemed to follow into infinity. Not only that, but there was no bird song. There had been when Sebastian and I first entered, I was sure of it, but it was only now that I noticed it had stopped. Don't you walk away from me, Oscar Jameson. Come here. I jumped and turned. It was my dad, stood here in the impossible forest with me. He was dressed in his work clothes, a light blue shirt with a salmon tie done up tight around his neck. He was holding something in one hand, beckoning me with a crooked finger of his other. Dad? What the hell are you doing here? Excuse me? He said sternly, taking a step toward me. I'm asking the questions. He held up the object, and I recognized it as his old work computer. I thought he threw it out years ago. Yes or no, he said, opening it to reveal a cracked screen. Did you do this? I gaped at him. Why was he here, quizzing me over an old laptop? It was so out of place. I had to be having the most vivid dream. N no, I told him. He stared at me with such intense anger that I instinctively took a step backwards. Are you sure? He said in a tight voice. Yes, Dad, I'm sure. What are you doing here? He shook his head sadly. He took the laptop under his arm, turned, and walked off the path. He strode into the forest in a straight line, the same tight, angry expression pulling the skin taut around his jaw. Dad! I called after him. Where are you going? What's going on? He didn't respond. He just kept walking. A low-hanging tree branch hit him in the face and he didn't even flinch. He just kept walking until his strength seemed to falter and he stumbled to the ground, collapsing as if falling apart. He didn't get back up. I decided then that I had to be in some kind of insane, lucid dream. So, how would it end? 
Did I have to die like in most nightmares? I didn't welcome the idea of dying in a dream so clear and realistic, and the thought made me violently shiver. I folded my arms tightly, trying to brace against the shudders. I felt the soft contact of my skin beneath my hands. I wasn't shivering from the dread. I was now shirtless. I looked down at the goosebumps on my arms with trickling nausea. Did I do this to myself? Had I blacked out? Oscar? It was my mom, staring at me with fear and pity. What happened to your shirt? Have you walked home like this? Feeling exposed, shrinking away from the cold, and seeing the concern on the face of this apparition that I couldn't be sure was my mother, it was too much. Hot tears began to stream down my face, nourishing my cheek with some warmth in the bitter cold. What happened? She said again, with more desperation. Tell me. I knew why this moment felt familiar. I was sure it had happened before. All the boys in my school had cornered me after football, calling me a runt and other much worse names. They tore my shirt from me and laughed at my small form and the insubstantial muscles on my arms. It had been a cold winter like this one, and they mimicked my shivering with overdramatic spasms and stuttered their words through chattering teeth. Well, my mother's doppelganger said. I don't remember, I said quietly. Don't lie to me. I'm not. I was angry then. I'll lie to you all I want anyway. I don't know who or what you are, but you're not my mother. A moment of shock, and then the same tight, angry expression on her face that was on my father's. So be it, she said in a strange voice, and then did the same as my dad. She turned, marched into the trees, and collapsed. My clothing returned, but I barely felt warmer. The air felt as though it had grown colder. I heard a clicking sound and a sigh, both sounded like they came from somewhere above where I stood. I searched the trees, and that's when I first saw it. Something squatted in the thick, strong branches of a tree that grew just off the dirt path. It was humanoid, vaguely, but its limbs were long and its bones bulged beneath its overstretched black skin. Long, flaccid fingers wrapped around a branch to keep it balanced, and I thought that it looked like some kind of disgusting crossbreed of a frog and a bat. When it spoke to me, its voice was slow and guttural, like an electronic speaker running on waning batteries. You repeat your mistakes. I stared at it and realized after several moments of silence that it was waiting for my response. Is this real? I said, unable to think of anything better to say to the creature. It yelped, in amusement I suppose, and began to climb down the tree. It did so with surprising speed and ease, and when it reached the ground, it almost plopped to the forest floor like a viscous liquid settling. Its movements provoked my nausea, and I watched it gather itself back into its crouching stance before it spoke again. Will you learn? Will I learn what? I asked angrily. Learn or flee? I couldn't look at the being any longer, and I gazed at my feet. Flee. I wasn't sure what choice I'd made, only that I wanted it to end. It made a growling noise and closed the distance between us 
with frightening speed. Its strangled voice grew even more quiet. So be it. I felt a breeze behind me, and I turned to find the mouth of the forest where Sebastian and I had first entered. The endless forest had shrunk back to its natural boundaries, and even the cold had somewhat subsided. Had I had some kind of fit or attack? Surely I wouldn't be standing here if that was the case. Sebastian was still missing too, and I held his lead in my hand. Maybe he ran back to the house? I looked back into the trees, and there was no sign of him. I called his name, and heard nothing back. I'd have to come back and find him later. I dejectedly left the forest, feeling as though I was being watched as I did, and returned to the street. Approaching our house, I noticed the drive was empty. I picked my pace, angry. I couldn't believe my parents had leave while I was out. I pounded up the steps and tried the door handle. It jiggled, but the door stayed put. They'd even locked the door behind them, without giving me a key. I hammered on the door with my fist, my eyes blurring. I'd had enough. I'd had enough of the day, and I wanted to curl up on my bed with my dog. But this stupid place had taken everything from me in one fell swoop. I peered through the window, and my breath caught. The house was empty. Worse than empty. It was a wreck. There were none of our boxes, no sign of my parents, not even footprints in the dust and the detritus that covered the floor. Desperate, I crossed the street and picked a house at random. I knocked on the door until a man answered, peering down at me through his glasses. Can I help you? He asked reluctantly. Did you see anybody leave that house? I pointed across the street, and he followed my gesture. What, recently? I nodded, and he laughed incredulously. No, son. Last time I saw someone leave that place, I wasn't even retired yet. It's been eight years, I reckon. Sorry. He closed the door before I could ask anything else. And he left me stupefied. Maybe he just didn't notice us move in? Or maybe, somehow, we hadn't anymore. Learn or flee? God. What hadn't I learned? I had never slept outside before. My neck ached, my ribs throbbed, and I felt as though my body had been thrown down a hill. I had managed to salvage some blankets from a recycling bank at the bottom of the street, and having wrapped myself up as best as I could, I drifted in and out of a fitful sleep on the park's cold bench. I woke up once or twice, thinking I could hear Sebastian barking, but when I held my breath and listened, all I heard was the occasional calls of nighttime creatures and the chattering of leaves as the forest waited patiently for me. In the morning, I loitered around the house, but my parents didn't come back. I sat on the grass, and I'm sure I would have earned some questions from my neighbours if any of them had left their houses in the several long hours I sat there, trying to decode what happened to me in the previous day. Eventually, with a sickening pinch in my stomach, I surrendered to the knowledge that I had to return to the forest and finish something. My dog was still missing, and my parents, wherever they were, didn't live here, even though all logic and common sense shouldn't have made it so. I came to the wall of sycamores that encircled the forest, and as I passed between them, I could instantly sense I was being watched. 
I followed the dirt path as I had before, and it wasn't long before it revealed itself to me. You return, it rattled. It was perched on a branch, its leathery skin twisting as it tilted its head. My dog, I said. I want him back. Then learn. I won't leave this time, I assured it. You can't leave this time, it corrected me. Learn. I looked around again and realized the forest had grown once again to meet the horizon. The creature was gone, and I was alone, at least for a few moments. Oscar, come here a minute. That voice. It was a voice that made me feel small and powerless, even now, years on. I knew who it belonged to, and despite myself, I faced her. Alice was a little older than me. She had shining brown hair that was always tied in a perfect ponytail. Her teeth were straight. Her nose was a cute little button that shone pink when she flashed a wide smile, and her eyes sparkled when she was amused. She made me feel worthless. And here she was again, beckoning me with a flourish of a slender hand. Her boyfriend stood beside her, alongside her usual entourage. They all looked at me like I was the perfect prey. And, and I suppose, I always had been. Are you stupid? She spoke so gently, as if being kind. Come here, darling. I slowly walked towards her, and as I did, a likeness of my old school built itself around us. It materialized out of thin air, like dust coalescing into the counterfeit scene. The trees of the forest were still all around us. It was like a chunk of the school had been ripped out and placed whole in front of me. Good boy, she smiled. Take this. She handed me a phone, placing it into my hand, which was now smaller and softer. I surveyed my body. Whatever was taking me through these forays of my past, it was even changing my physique to suit the illusion, turning me into an effigy of my preteen self. Alice watched my surprise with a raised eyebrow. You on drugs or something? She mimicked my surprise, and her hangers-on laughed with her. She gripped my wrist harshly and shook it. Do you know how to use such an expensive phone? I nodded dumbly, ashamed of myself. How could somebody that had felt so far away for years suddenly take back all their control from me? She tapped a little beat on the screen with her perfect fingernails. Open the camera and start recording, sweet. I obeyed. But recording what? Oh. I remembered. There she was. Poor Harisha, hugging herself as she trembled like a cornered animal. She had been a quiet girl, and the very few times I spoke to her, she was gentle and nervous. Alice loved gentle and nervous. What have you been saying about me, Harisha? Alice always used a calm, almost pleasant voice when she was planning what to do with you like a cat playing with his catch. I haven't said anything, Harisha murmured, her voice cracking with fear. What was that? Alice leaned forward and cupped her ear. I can't hear you through that awful accent. Harisha began to cry. This was all happening exactly as it had before, meaning Alice would soon have her fingers round around clumps of the girl's hair, and Harisha's wobbly tooth would be dislodged by a punch to the face, all of which I would capture for her to share around the school. I was being forced through these events for a second time 
within the boundaries of this forest. Learn, the creature kept telling me. I stopped recording. Alice's boyfriend noticed and he snatched the phone from me. Oscar isn't even feeling this. He's chickened out. She rounded on me instantly, her smile gone. Do as you're told. I put my hands in my pockets and hung my head. I didn't even have the courage still to answer back directly. I swear that from somewhere deep in the trees, the breeze carried the ghost of a whisper. Good. A murmur of ooh and nervous laughter bubbled from a group, and I knew she was furious. Her quick footsteps pattered on the artificial concrete beneath us. I squeezed my eyes shut, and I braced myself. She grabbed a handful of my hair and forced me to the ground. The first punch was aimed at my nose, and I tried to shake the flares from my vision when the second came, and then the third. I curled up into a ball and tried to protect my face as best I could. The pain was very real, as was the humiliation as I lay there bombarded by fists and laughter. Finally, and abruptly, it all stopped. The silence was deafening. I unfurled my body, and I was myself again, sixteen and laying in the dirt on the forest floor. The school was gone, and my tormentors had vanished. The path still stretched forever in multiple directions, but one route changed. An almost imperceptible light had begun to glow at the path's terminus, and, even from a distance, that could have been hundreds of miles away for all I knew by now. It felt warm. I got up and dusted myself off. The pain from my battering hadn't fully faded, and although I was free of blood and bruises, a lingering sting lay in my skin not allowing me to truly forget. I followed the path that had gained the light, and as I walked, I wondered. Had I changed that event, or merely relived it? In reality, I had done as Alice had said all those years ago. I always did as she said. Harisha's embarrassment had driven her away from people even further. But... That wasn't my fault, was it? I was only following orders. A stillness shattered. A smash, followed by a torrent of noise like rainfall. I followed the source, and there was a car, surrounded by young boys. One of its windows had been broken, and the children looked at one another with their mouths agape. Nearly all of them held stones in their hands. Crap! One of them cried, and he fled. The rest of them copied him, and one caught my shoulder as he ran past me. Oscar, cover for us! They left me stood there, and a man materialized out of nowhere, much like the vision before. He looked furious. He gawked to the car window, then at me. Did you do this? He pointed at my feet where the stones of the other boys had been dropped. I flexed my finger nervously, and I could feel that I was younger in form again. Y yes sir, sorry sir. Suddenly, everything was gone. I was alone again. Had I passed this test? Wrong. The creature, it squatted on a fallen log, watching me. What do you mean? I said angrily. I was there. Someone had to answer for it. You did not cast a stone. Criminals escaped, and a fool paid the price. But... I wrestled with its logic, and although I could understand, it didn't feel fair. You chose ease. Nothing was learned. But... I did learn my lesson. I never hung out with those boys again. You robbed them of their lesson. 
With that, it slunk back into the undergrowth. Learn yours. I learned so many lessons. Many I deserved. Some I still truly think I didn't. I relived what felt like a hundred reproductions of my past mistakes, of lessons I had to learn, in what soon became something like an endless fever dream. I learned things about my place in a casual web that I didn't even know existed around me. I answered for the time I left the back door of my uncle's house unlocked and his house was burgled. Something my parents must have hidden from me for fear of my guilt. I was too young to know, and only would the most spiteful people in existence truly blame me for such a young and innocent lapse in judgement. But I quickly learned that I was, without prejudice, being made to answer for every single thing. I relived a party I'd gone to only around a year ago, and seeing that, had I stayed and chatted with Selena Roberts for just an hour longer, I'd have been there to spot some unwelcome addition to her drink that had enabled an assault that still woke her up in the dead of night in cold sweats and violent thrashes. How could I have known? The forest didn't care for that. I didn't hunger, nor did I thirst or tire or weaken. Hours became days, weeks, and months, until it seemed I had relived my entire life tenfold. After every choice that pleased the forest, I would look for the light, growing ever closer, inch by inch. Eventually, when it was so close that I could feel its prickling warmth on my skin, like blood rushing back to a deadened limb, I approached and reached for the light. Oscar? The light vanished like a switch had been flipped off, and I was stood at the mouth of the forest. My mother faced me in the woods threshold, and she was looking at me with a half-curious smile. Are you alright? She asked me with a sidelong stare. I took stock of my surroundings. Normal. The trees weren't innumerable. The path followed a route that didn't tangle my brain, and Sebastian stood at my feet, looking up at me innocently and patiently. He was my sign that I was back to reality from wherever I'd been before, and I blunked back warm tears. I was... I didn't know what to say. Delaying the move? Mom finished the sentence for me. Come on. Your dad and I have been waiting for you. What move? She laughed at me gently. Are you feeling alright? I don't know. How long have I been here? All her amusement was gone, leaving only concern. Honey? Please, just humour me. She shrugged and wrapped a cardigan closer around her. Oh, I don't know. About an hour? I was stunned. And we're moving. Moving house? Yes, dear. The new job fell through, so your dad got his old job back. But obviously we can't have our old house back. She approached and placed a hand on my forehead. Did you hurt yourself? No, I'm fine, I mumbled. I followed her back to the house, Sebastian in tow, and climbed in amongst the same boxes and cases we'd started unpacking only the previous day. On to another new start. I frequently still wonder if I've been put back into the same reality. Everything seems the same as it ever was, for the most part. But sometimes, old friends and acquaintances let slip the details that give me pause for thought. Apparently, Alice walks with a limp these days, a reminder of the time she pushed somebody a little too far. One of the boys who used to throw stones was the victim of a nasty and messy hit and run, for which the driver was never caught. 
I don't spend too long asking the questions though, because I've learnt my lesson. I don't want to go back. I promise, I've learnt my lesson. <laughs>